um, scenario. It was basically the AU convention from 2010 that I attended, and um, the guys seemed to like what I was doing and try to um, learn year by year. So there was really some great conventions on the, on the racing pigeon side. And um, the last one was obviously the Omaha convention in 2014, where Jerry and myself, I think it was actually, you wrote a little article in the quarterly on how many kilometers or miles we actually traveled during this whole thing. And while we were actually there, as you know, Jerry is forever running and there was looking very dapper and very smart at the um, convention, at the Youngbird National in Louisville, um, Kentucky. And um, it actually came to a discussion that perhaps it would be a good idea if we try and do this during the, the uh, nationals with you guys as well and on the fancy fiction side. And specifically why we actually thought about it is that during that time that I spent there, the, the two or three days that I spent there um, driving there and also at the show itself, many, many people actually came to me and asked me questions specifically on what was happening, why was it always that their pigeons were becoming ill after the show, and that they actually had this scenario where they basically brought healthy pigeons or seemingly healthy pigeons to the show, and shortly after the show, things started going wrong. So we also have a very great sort of bond with the um, Louisville, Kentucky scenario, as my wife and myself breed American saddler horses. Um, in my mind, as you guys, Think that every breed that you breed is the most beautiful and the most god-given animal on earth that's what we think as well with our horses and the louisville kentucky louisville show world champion show is actually held in louisville kentucky as, as well um at that at that um center itself so in the dome itself so we know louisville very well and as i say it's close to my heart and it was really great to be able to be asked during that show so these just are just a few of the horses that my wife shows and um, at our plot, we have a small um, nine hectares, um, small holding in the eastern side of Pretoria in, in South Africa. The whole plot is just filled with feathers and with adam animals, and, the whole of the, and most of them are actually feathered animals. I bred the first pigeon I ever owned was a Mondina and a Lahore um, in 1973. So the fancy pigeon lays very close to my heart as well. Um, and it's really great to be invited here, and I hope I can tweak your interest tonight, and if I can only do that, and that just tweak a little bit of interest that we can learn as we go along, and that this becomes an annual sort of event for you guys. So the question is then, the big why. Why does it happen that I take my pigeons seemingly healthy to the show, and then two weeks later, or ten days after I arrive back home, suddenly things fall apart? The guys stand there, and they tear their hairs out, hair out, and they say, listen, just, this is just incredible, you know, I can't believe it, the pigeons look so well during the show, and they looked so well when I took them there, and why has things actually gone wrong? And, and the main reason for this is simply this little word, stress. You know, when we were at university, when I was a student at university, all of our professors harped on this word, stress, and they actually said to us, this is what causes the disease, it's stress, and it's stress. And it took me a very, very long time to understand the significance of this little word, stress and to understand what stress actually does to people, to animals, to every living human being. And essentially what happens on a physiological level is that it causes a reduction in food intake, very importantly a reduction in water intake, and by doing that it causes a weight loss and dehydration. So those are the four major physiological things that actually happen. And it's literally like that. That's what the pigeon feels like when he's at a show. He feels stressed. He feels he's in the jaws of this big, strange animal that he doesn't know, the show. And it's a, it's a three- or four-day event to actually get here, to get back home. And it really has major, major implications on this animal's health. And that's basically, if you look at it and you get the strange sort of feeling about it, that's basically what happens. And essentially, on a, if you break it all down, it suppresses the immune system and it disturbs the digestive system. Okay, so you've got this pigeon that goes healthy to the show, but the immune system is locked down and the digestive system is basically locked down. And if you really want to get into it, all of this type of thing happens. And this is what the really clever professor that was at our university tried to explain to us. But basically, it's just so simple and um, basic in the sense that these animals have this stress. Cortisone, which is basically the hormone that the adrenal glands excrete in the body, is raised as a result of stress. In other words, the adrenal gland gets overactive and it excretes more cortisone. 
And the cortisone is actually the thing that then decreases the immunity. Okay, so it's stress, increased cortisone, and decreased immunity. And then everything starts falling apart. Now, it's really important when we look at the dehydration side of it to understand how the whole physiological scenario of a pigeon works and the anatomy of a pigeon works. And we have to understand that a pigeon urinates and defecates, in other words, passes his stool and his urine through one opening, through what we call the glyca. A pigeon doesn't, as other um, animals, have a urinary tract and a um, um, fetal tract that actually passes into different places. It all passes in one place. And that's why it's so critically, critically important to actually understand what the fecal segment of a pigeon is and what it should look like. So if you look at the dropping of a pigeon, that's the obvious perfect dropping that you should need to have. It should be well formed, it should have a definitive sort of form to it, and then critically important at the top of the little white cap that you see there, that top of white cap is actually the urinary segment. Okay, so you want the dry um, dropping that comes out with a little white segment which is basically the, the urine sitting there. Because the pigeon is made in such a way that in his large bowel, he actually reabsorb in that bottom area here. There he will actually reabsorb most of the water so that you get a, a nicely formed dropping just with that little piece of white on top of it. The moment the pigeon starts taking too much water and the moment that the kidneys let too much water through, you then actually find that you have a sloppy dropping but you've got to really look at it carefully. And this is critically for you guys to understand it. I'll give you five take-home points tonight, okay? And this is one of the take-home points because I know when I do these lectures, you know, we ramble on and on and we tell you, give you a lot of facts. But this is one of the important things because if you understand this, it will make it easier for you to, to differentiate what has gone wrong with your pigeon. When a pigeon has a lot of water that he passes by right there, you can actually see there's the fecal segment, but there's this whole batch of water lying around that. That is actually not diarrhea, okay? So there's nothing wrong with the intestinal tract in this pigeon. This, what's happened here is the pigeon has either drunk too much water or his kidneys have actually excreted too much water. So you, when you get the really watery dropping, water, clear water, you know that the pigeon is actually suffering from a kidney ailment or an overintake of water. Okay? And that becomes critically important when we look at this now. At the two main diseases that pigeons are, uh, that are often picking up at a show itself. So what happens with the dehydration? Because remember we said the bird pigeon's going to eat less, he's going to take less water, and he's going to start dehydrating because he's still excreting his, his urine, but he's not taking in enough water. We get a loss of electrolytes, a loss of body mass, and critically important, when the pigeon loses his body mass, he loses protein. Okay, you will feel when you take pigeons home, Many that times when you get home, that pigeon is a third to 25 to 33 percent of his body weight is lost, and he's losing it in these big pectoral muscles, in the big muscles at the bottom. And that's actually the amino acids, which is the building blocks of the protein that this pigeon is losing. So the amino acids are critically, critically important to a pigeon. A pigeon needs, during this period of stress, needs amino acids to counteract that body and um, mass loss. As a result of dehydration, the immunity is suppressed even more. And then critically important, this pigeon starts looking droopy. He loses his vigor and he loses his appearance. Okay, so that's what the dehydration will actually cause. So instead of sitting there with a the neck stretched out with a health, healthy eye, with the, the plumage being all healthy and beautiful, this pigeon is starting to lose his whole vitality, his whole show ability. And if your pigeon is going to be dehydrating at the show, not taking enough fluid, not um, preventing the loss of amino acids, that's actually what he's going to look like in the end. And there's no way that the judge is then going to be able to place that pigeon at the top of the pile or um, have a good show. Good so electrolytes. What are the electrolytes that we talk about? And how do we actually think primarily of what the good electrolytes are? It's very, very important that you avoid poultry electrolytes. For goodness sake, don't try and save two bucks, two dollars or three dollars and buy yourself a bag of poultry electrolytes. Okay, if you look at that poultry electrolyte that you've got up there, and I clearly put it up, it's not a bad electrolyte for poultry, but it's really a horrible electrolyte for pigeons. 
if you look at the vitamin A and D3, that value is way, way, way higher than any pigeon can actually use. They're actually being poisoned by the vitamin A and D. So chickens need far higher vitamin A and D, and the electrolytes um, composition per se as well is completely different to what a, what a pigeon actually needs. So you cannot use a chicken felt um, electrolyte um, for, uh, for, for um, pigeons. You've got to use a pigeon um, electrolyte like made specifically for pigeons. You want to start before the show, you want to continue after the show show, and as I said, critically important, you want to use the correct formulation. It's no good just using a cheap formulation that you can buy over the counter. You want to use specifically something made for pigeons. And what would that correct formulation then be? You want a correct balance of the electrolyte. You want high quality raw materials because again, a pigeon is far more refined than a, than a chicken. There's no doubt about it. The whole physiological effect of the pigeon is more refined than a chicken itself. And then very, very importantly, in this electrolyte, you want to add the amino acids. Remember we said the amino acids are the building blocks of the proteins. So you need an electrolyte that supplies amino acids as well to prevent the body loss. And very, very few, almost none of the chicken um, electrolytes will actually do that. And it will not just be the big amino acids, the important ones, the major ones, but also the smaller ones, the minor amino acids. And then finally, very, very importantly, you want to use an electrolyte in pigeons that actually stimulates the water intake. There are certain things that can stimulate the water intake smell and um, types of um, electrolytes that will stimulate the water intake in pigeons. And again, the poultry electrolytes won't be doing that. Okay, so that's a good electrolyte. Once you've ticked all of those boxes, that's the ideal electrolyte that you'll be using. Within our range, the Aviomed range, the, electro, the electrolyte um, amino acid, uh, um, electrolyte that we supply ticks all of those boxes. We have very specifically amino acids, small amino acids, large amino acids in there, and then we have a very specific flavorant in there that will, if you open this electrolyte, if you go to the tomorrow and buy this electrolyte, we just take it and open it up, you'll get a very specific smell on that electrolyte and a seed smell of that electrolyte that will stimulate the intake of water of your pigeons during the show. Okay. Right, so if we're looking then at the dehydration per se and we're looking at the show per se, I'm going to run you through very quickly because we will, it's late in the evening and I don't want to keep you here too long, but we'll run you through very quickly what the basic causes are of disease when your pigeon goes up. And essentially it would basically be the viral diseases and the bacterial diseases. Yes, the parasites such as worms and coccidiosis and all of those other smaller diseases are important, but they're not going to cause death in your pigeon. They're not going to cause a major crisis. The major crisis will be caused by the viral diseases and the bacterial diseases, and those are the ones that we'll be focusing on primarily. So on the viral diseases, by far the most important, paramyxovirus or Newcastle virus. Circovirus is the young bear disease, and that's a whole topic on its own. And then herpes and fox viruses are important as well. But for you guys, primarily the paramyxovirus is the most important. It's very important to understand what we call the incubation period. The time from picking up the virus until the time from showing the symptoms and then further to that when that pigeon actually excretes that virus again and can actually infect the next pigeon. And that incubation period is highly, highly important because if that incubation period falls within the time that it can actually start picking it up in, during the show and actually excreting it during the show. Some of these viruses are very quick and they can actually do that. Or the pigeon has picked it up at home and on the way here, because of the stress and scenario, he actually starts excreting the virus and that they will actually then infect it. So you have to know what that incubation period is and we have to be cognizant of the fact that it could happen, that they picked it up shortly before the show and at the show, they're actually starting to excrete and starting to infect the other patients. Okay, so we can get the mixed paramyxovirus as well, where the pigeon actually has paramyxovirus of chickens as well as paramyxovirus of, of um, um, pigeons per se. And that's why I very strongly recommend when you vaccinate the pigeons that you use a vaccine for chickens as well as a pigeon vaccine. Okay. In, in a scenario where we're actually doing this um, vaccinating, vaccinating for 
realize that you have a 10 day period in between the vaccines. So we vaccinate for the chicken vaccine of um, paramixa first and 10 days later for the chicken uh, paramixa. If you don't see fit to use both, it's critically, critically important that at least you do one paramixa vaccine. May I have a show of hands? How many of you guys routinely do paramixa vaccines out in there? That is incredible because in South Africa, I can absolutely tell you that on the fancy pigeon side, it's nowhere near what you guys are showing us. We get very, very seldom um, pigeon fanciers in South Africa, or let's say 50% of the fancy pigeon fanciers do not actually vaccinate for paramyxovirus. And it's so, so important to actually do that and to do it correctly. As I'm saying, maybe this little bit of information that I'm giving you is something that you don't, do not know or that you're not doing at the moment. Try and vaccinate with a pigeon vaccine, something like the Nobulus or a Chevy Vac, um, PMV1, a specific pigeon vaccine, and then try two weeks later to vaccinate with a chicken vaccine. Okay, in that case, you need a chicken vaccine. It's not like the electrolytes because it's two different viruses, but both of them can actually um, affect the pigeon. So it can happen that you're vaccinated with a pigeon vaccine, and when they get to the show, they actually pick up the other strain of the virus and they can actually then still get the disease. Okay, now this chicken vaccine is basically the vaccine that they sell specifically for chickens, and it's the dead vaccine that you also need to inject. So after the lecture or during the course of tomorrow, if you've got questions on that, please come and talk to me about it. Obviously, it's really important, oh, difficult in such a short space of time to run through everything and explain everything. This typical paramyxovirus that we see in the olden days in pigeons where they fell around and they had nervous symptoms are seldom seen these days. The turning of the head are seldom seen. Remember that paramyxovirus is primarily a virus that affects the kidneys. So in most cases with paramyxovirus, what we will see today is this severely wet dropping. And after that, the disease such as young bear disease and some of the other diseases will come in. But the cl clinical syndrome of falling around and turn heads and things, those we don't see that often anymore. What about vaccination? How do we do the vaccination? Number one, it's absolutely critical to realize that it's no good using the live vaccine. The Lasota vaccine that you put in the water or that you drop in the eyes is of no importance whatsoever and cannot protect your kids. So you have to inject it. It's been proven very, very scientifically again and again and again that the live vaccine that you put in the drinking water has a very temporary effect at the most, maybe two to three weeks, and the virus and the um, antibodies just disappear. So you have to literally inject. You have to inject and primarily try and inject and then the two weeks later again with it with it. Uh, Young bear disease, you will find, will cause a diarrhea, a real diarrhea, and there, there you will see it's a sloppy stool. There's not that much urine around. The fecal segment is actually affected, and the pigeons will start originally in babies, vomiting with the diarrhea and severe loss of weight, and about 20% of those babies will then actually die. The circo virus, or young bear disease virus, is the virus that affects the immune system of the pigeons. So already the immunity is depressed after the show, if he then picks up um, circovirus, it absolutely wipes out the immune system, and then those pigeons are absolutely prone to picking up any and many other diseases as such. So the circo is primarily a disease that wipes the immune system and causes other diseases to come to the point. Okay. So there's a whole range of medications that you can use during the year, and there's a very specific program on our website that you can go and have a look at, specifically written for fancy pigeons in how to treat your pigeons and try and prevent this. But what I want to talk about tonight and, and keep on talking about is how do we prevent these things by picking up at the show itself. Okay. On the young bird disease, we have really nice DVDs that I've got available if you guys want to come up after the show. Three DVDs, the one is basically on emerging new pigeon diseases that we see that aren't very well known. The other one is on breeding fertility and performance. And the third one that's not up here is specifically a DVD on young bear disease. All of these DVDs have been made during my lectures and have been highly adapted where they actually pull everything into the DVD. And you can see the whole thing very, very clearly. And there's some real nice discussion sessions as well 
with top pigeon fanciers from all over the world. So it would play to come around after the uh, next year if you guys want to do it. Okay. So what about carrier diseases? It's real important, and I think this is number two take-home message. We had the one first take-home message. Number two is you have to realize that there are diseases that pigeons will have within their body, within their system, that they show no symptoms of whatsoever. And the moment this fantastic little word stress, stress comes to the fore, then these diseases actually come to the fore and the pigeons again then start excreting this disease and infecting the pigeon next to him or the pigeon feed it three cages down. Okay. So stress will actually cause the carrier diseases to come to the fore. And those are the ones that primarily we find as carrier diseases. All these fancy words, but effectively, it's the upper respiratory diseases, the familiar ornithosis or microplasmosis, paratyphoid, which I think all of you guys know because it's really prevalent in, in the fancy pigeon, and then these two new diseases, muscle and wing disease and red gut. Okay, all four of those diseases, five of those diseases, actually are within the pigeon, and if the stress of the disease comes to the fore or the stress of the show, those diseases can actually come to the fore and they can clinically become ill. I'm not going to talk much on the upper respiratory diseases for the simple reason that it's a very, very broad spectrum of discussion. Essentially, all I'm saying is that pigeons can pick up either chlamydia, which is the one type of respiratory disease, or mycoplasma, which is the other type of respiratory disease. And it's so important to understand the critical, critical thing is if you look at this, these photographs say, different um, ways of actually expressing both of those diseases <coughs> but you cannot treat mycoplasma and chlamydia with the same antibiotic okay you need to use very specific antibiotics in other words the chlamydia anti um, bug, bug is not susceptible to the antibiotic that the mycoplasma is susceptible to and for that specific reason we've also found in the last few years in the racing pigeons that the two bugs are actually coming together as one disease a combination of chlamydia and mycoplasma affecting the pigeons. So we have to actually go and be proactive and develop an antibiotic that is actually good for both of those diseases. One antibiotic alone is no longer good enough. Okay, so we would basically use the antibiotic called Spirodox. And this, I'm only going to be talking about four or five of our products that I feel absolutely comfortable about showing you the photographs. This is not a lecture to sell my products. I'm still absolutely trying to you know, not do that. What I'm doing is I'm going to say to you, this product has a major advantage over any of the other products in the marketplace for this and this specific reason, and that's why I'm putting the product up here. This is the only antibiotic that combines the antibiotics for chlamydia and for mycoplasma. It has spiromycin for the mycoplasma and doxycycline at the right dose for the chlamydia. So it actually does spot, um, chlamydiosis and mycoplasmosis together. So if you get down from the show and you see the respiratory disease starting, the ideal is to use this for seven <coughs> days and then to carry <coughs> on with the doxycycline for a further 14 days at least. And why do we say for 14 days? Because again, it's highly, highly important to understand that the chlamydia part of it, the one eye cold part of it, that bug cannot be killed and cannot be eliminated from the pigeon system with a seven-day treatment. You need at least 21 days of the doxycycline to clear chlamydia, to clear that specific bug. So you've got seven days of doxycycline in there, and you've got another 14 days of doxycycline in there. Okay, so it's a 21-day treatment to clear the respiratory disease. And that's the two that we basically would recommend them for respiratory. I want to spend far more time on this one, on paratyphoid. This is really the one, as you know, that you guys struggle with, that you suffer with, and this is the one that has so much implications for your pigeon. Okay. So what are the different forms? This organism called um, paratyphoid, Salmonella typhimurium, has a very specific disease type of syndrome, and the problem is that it doesn't just affect one organ. It affects many, many different organs. It starts off with a pigeon just being ill, being inappetent, not eating, not looking good. It then spreads from the intestine, where it causes a diarrhea, into the liver. Okay, so it gets absorbed by the bloodstream and it goes into the liver. It can <coughs> stop there in the liver, 
and the pigeon can actually get rid of it to a degree, but it actually lives within the liver and starts reinfecting the pigeon again the moment the stress happens. So from the liver, it then actually goes into the kidneys as well. It goes into the joints. It can even go into the lungs. It literally goes right through the pigeon. And it can even go into the brain, causing typically what we call the stargazing. Typical, typical paratyphoid, non-paramixo. Okay, so this is not the virus. This is paratyphoid that has caused the middle ear infection and the brain infection in the pigeon. So what happens with paratyphoid? Intestinal tract, liver, and from there it goes to the kidneys, to the lungs, to the um, upper respiratory system, and to the brain. And then lastly, the death one, the one that's really, really bad, is when it actually goes into the joints itself. Okay, so you can get the paratyphoid that will actually lodge within the joints, even in babies, causing the swollen joints, and the typical boils within the joint. Now, the bad news is, that whatever you do, no magic potion, no magic product, no medicine in the world will ever clear the paratyphoid organ from the joint. If it's in the joint, it will be there for the rest of the pigeon's life. Okay. Unfortunately, that is the bottom line. We have not yet got a medicine that will clear it from the joints. It may get better. The pigeon may look better and it can actually start walking again. But the joint is so isolated from the rest of the body that that paratyphoid organism that actually sits in the joint hides away there and the antibiotics can't actually get to it. The best antibiotics in the world just can't get to it. So it will sit there and three months or six months or 12 months later, it will actually spread from the joints again and it will go back into the body and that pigeon will speed again. So the take-home message is you want to pr protect the pigeon from getting the paratyphoid in the joint. You want to be proactive and you want to prevent it from happening in the joint. If it's in the liver or in the kidneys or even in the brain, if you've got the correct antibiotics and use the right antibiotics, you will clear it. But if it's in the, in the joint, that pigeon is lost as a breeding pigeon because it will always be paratyphoid infected pigeons at the end of the Take our message number two, critically, critically important. But the other bad news is that this is also one of the bacteria that will go into the reproductive tract, okay? It doesn't cause anything in the cock. It won't actually be transmitted by the cock, but it actually goes into the ovaries of the pigeon and into the eggs of the pigeon per se. So it's one of the diseases where a pigeon that is actually infected, a hen that is infected, will actually infect the egg and the baby can actually be born with paratyphoid. And it can actually grow quite nicely, look perfectly okay, and at two or three months of age, it actually starts excreting the bug again. Okay, so you really want to make also sure that it never gets into the into the reproductive tract. That you prevent it from getting into the eggs and actually transmitting it from from pigeon, uh, from pigeon to pigeon. Mostly, if it's actually a clinical syndrome in the reproductive tract, you will find rough eggs, eggs that are actually um, flaked with blood and sometimes death or early resor resorption of your babies in the egg. So if you're starting to get deaths in the egg, or you're starting to get a situation where the babies are four or five or six days old, and they're starting to die, you have to think very carefully, isn't it perhaps better type what that I'm using? Okay. And then lastly, will it cause infertility in cocks? In my mind, no, but there's another reason why it's associated with infertility in cocks, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. Okay, now what about treating paratyphoid? And this is, every single pigeon fancier I know thinks this is the magic bullet for paratyphoid, okay? And that's absolutely the truth. It used to be, Baitrol used to be the be all and end all in treating paratyphoid in pigeons. To tell you the truth, it's the only antibiotic ever proven by science to actually get rid of paratyphoid where there's clinical trials being done on it. But, the important thing is, the trials that were done was done at four milliliters, four times the dose, so two to three milliliters per liter um, of drinking water. And I'm sorry, I'm now in the, in the liter scenario, but at four times the dose for 10 days. That would, in those days, and that, those, that work was done in the early 80s, more than 30 years ago, that work was actually done. Things have changed. There's a lot of resistance that's developed. It's no longer the be all and the end all. And the bad news is, if you're going to be giving a pigeon 
two to three milliliters per liter of drinking water, 30% of your pigeon cocks are going to be infertile. 30% of cocks, if you go, go to that higher dosage, will be infertile. It's not a case that every single time it'll happen, but we know now that that figure is 30%. And why? Specifically because Batril actually affects the fast um, um, replicating cells, the sperm cells of the pigeon. So the, the danger of using Batril at that dosage is that you will actually develop infertility. And as I say, there has been resistance, so it's not working as well as it used to in the olden days. Infertility, big, big problem. The cottons go onto the hen again and again and again, and you won't have the eggs at the <coughs> And it's early infertility. You get it in cots. Up from three, four years of age, they start becoming infertile. So what is the answer with paratyphoid? The only answer is actually doing what we call polybiotics, and that, that means combining the correct antibiotics in the treatment of paratyphoid. And if we look at a really good combination of, an, of antibiotics, this combination, the three-way combination that we've got there, makes all the sense in the world. The feraltadone kills the bacteria in the intestine. It's the very best antibiotic in the world to kill the bacteria in the intestine. But the disadvantage with the feraltadone, the yellow antibiotics that we all know about, that does not get absorbed by the intestine. Okay, so if that bug is already out of the intestine into the liver, it's of no use whatsoever. It's the fastest and it's the best in the intestine, but it works, doesn't work at all when it gets into the body. Okay. What do we add with amoxicillin? Amoxicillin is wonderful because amoxicillin is fast, it's safe, it gets into some of the organs, such as the liver but it will never get into the reproductive tract. It will never get into the brain. It will never get into the deep-seated organs such as the, as the lung itself. Okay, so chloroplenicol is actually the only antibiotic that has been proven to get into these difficult-to-reach places such as the brain, such as in the deep-seated in the lungs, etc. So if you're combining those three together, you've got the best possible antibiotic for the intestine, You've got the best possible fast-acting antibiotic to get the symptoms better, to kill, to help him not to die, to get over this critical phase of the period. And then you've got the best possible antibiotic to actually get into the organs itself. But again, you will then need to go for at least 10 day treatment with that antibiotic because you've got to get give the immunity of the pigeon a chance to actually also get over this whole disease. And those three antibiotics are specifically exactly covered in the typhoid cure, as I've explained it to you now. So that's a combination of feraltadone, amoxicillin, and chloramphenicol. And we've had unbelievable results with this antibiotic as a 10-day treatment um, for the prevention and the treatment of um, paratyphoid. Vaccination of paratyphoid. Again, critically important that if you have a high dosage of paratyphoid within your pigeons, or you've got a scenario where they're going to be reinfected by other pigeons again and again, you have to go the route of vaccination. So paratyphoid vaccine is very, very important. But number take home message number four or five, I can't remember where we are. Take home message is two times. You cannot use a single paratyphoid vaccine in pigeons. It is of no help whatsoever. If you've got paramyxo vaccine and you're going to vaccinate once, you're still going to have a good result. Better to do it twice. But if you do paratyphoid and you do one vaccine and you do one injection only, you may as well throw that vaccine into the toilet. It has no effect whatsoever. It builds up the immunity because it's a bacterial um, immunization and within two, <coughs> three, four, five weeks it's gone. Okay. Two vaccines are mandatory. Okay. Um, Jerry, do you know with Dr. K's vaccine, do they, are they also doing two or have they adapted it? They were two the first time and then one after. One after, after. absolutely. So they also two. They, there are some live vaccines apparently from Europe and they are work on a completely different basis. I'm not that in favor of a live vaccine for paratyphoid again. I like the dead vaccine better. And if you're going to be using the dead vaccine and you use it the first time, you have to go twice really really important okay okay so what's our vaccination re regime on paratyphoid what we do is we treat for 10 days with typhoid cure why do we do that because invariably when you have paratyphoid within your flock 
there are some pigeons that are carrying the disease that are ill at that moment in time. So you want to clear the disease from those pigeons that actually got it first. And you're going to be treating for 10 days with typhoid cure. And then on the 10th day of the treatment, you vaccinate the first time. And the 24th day or 20th day, you vaccinate again, 10 to 14 days apart. Okay, so typhoid cure 10 days. 10 days back on the 10th day vaccination and then 10 days later you vaccinate again. Okay. Okay, let's let's have a little bit of a break here and just get some questions because I know paratyphoid is something that you've got 101 questions about. So let's hear yeah, or discussions or things that you don't agree with. Yes, sir. This fire again. Yes. And I saw this in, uh, in the, uh, the quarterly yes. that they were Is this available? Yes, it's basically what's happened is that it will be available but from, from Jets, okay? Um, they do not have all the products at the moment because there was a major crisis with our postal system. We have the only country in the world that would have had for three months no postal system. Okay. <laughs> no postal system whatsoever. So we couldn't get any product to America in, during November, December, and there was a hell of a backlog with the usage. But what we've decided is that you can actually go to JET, order this program from them at the $80, $79, get your coxy worm free, and they will ship it. It's on the way. They will ship it the moment it arrives, free of charge. So we will actually carry the shipping costs. Okay. So if you go and you place the order, they'll place and pay for the order. They will ship it free of charge to you guys. Okay. So as a second question, how many birds does that take care of? The, the, the um, way it's actually put out, the typhoid cure is highly concentrated. It's one gram per two liter of drinking water. So we worked out that that's an 80 to 100 pigeon gene. Um, the, the, the whole system. The whole system. Yes. If we have three or 400 pigeons, you really aren't following this program. It is, unfortunately. And that's, there's no doubt that the more you have, the more, more difficult it becomes to control disease. You know? And it may be that you want to then just use this as Remember that we're saying that you're going to be the program per se is a pre um, show program during the show and post show program. So, if you could identify which pigeons you're actually going to take to the show, you can actually put them separate and treat them separate before the show, during the show, and all. What kind of words are all the rest of that? I've just been concerned with all the equipment. I'm sorry, we've got far to labor than we wanted. Uh, but you do know that Dr. Bolton is going to be here for the next two days. He's going to be asked to answer any questions you have. We'll give you as much time as you want. But uh, um, maybe we should just, until they shut us down, let's just discuss. I would rather just take questions. Okay. And also, Doctor, Doctor, my request of the Doctor, I did put everything on live so you can go on. Uh, on my YouTube channel and whatever he did. We won't have slide by slide, but you have him discussing. And you guys can go over and over. 